Radio Company of Dismiss. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you Lovely. <laughs>
a football fan long standing and also just like yourself jim and claudio i, I love football programs and i have since i first started going to games uh, i'm an arsenal fan and i started going to highbury back in 7071 the year we're going to be talking about so oh, i actually yeah. remember getting hold of, of a copy of sky blue um outside the ground <laughs> the ground there were all these program sellers and we used to sell the away programs a couple a week or two afterwards they normally added another few pence on or another, you know onto the cost of the program they're always more expensive outside the ground than if you bought them at the time but nevertheless you got so i actually i've i have had you know the sky blue old john elvin created um for the yes. commentary game at highfield road back in 1970 um you know, obviously, um, and I'm, I'm, we'll bring Matt in in a second, of course, as well. You know, um, I, I've had a lifelong passion for football programmes, and I've had a real interest in this period we're talking about and this design. The, the kind of the world of the football programme really was transformed in this period. And John Elvin was the pioneer. There were others as well, but really he was the, the mastermind of a new vision for the football programme. Beforehand, they were very slim affairs, tended to have no photographs and things like that. And also, they tended to be, um, just the covers used to just be images of the football crest or or a, a drawing of a stadium. They And then they repeated game after game. There was nothing particularly intriguing about them. And then and then there was this big transformation. So, and, and I had this love of, of, of John Elvin and really, um, and, and that's how I met Matt, because we met online. He was, he had fallen in it had this also this passion for John Elwin's work in this period and and we decided that together we would we would we would sort of join together and put a book together not only looking at John Elvin but also some of the others um, who were very much part of this program revolution of of, of the late 60s and early 70s Matt <laughs> <laughs> nice one Alan <laughs> what Alan said um <laughs> No, really good to be on this. Um, not only have you got a, a West Brom fan in Mark, you've got an Aston Villa fan here as well. Uh, <laughs> oh, not God. Sure the cold, so I'm sorry. Uh, on lucky, behalf we're, of, lucky we're so pleased, we've, Matt. We've had a rotten start to the season. You three are all gloating, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, we're, yes, we're enjoying yes. it for the first time in a while. I bet um, you are, yes. <laughs> but no, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. I've got my own graphic design practice called Monday Nights, um, but I'm also a programme collector. Um, and... The reason I started program collecting um, was because my dad had a has a has a huge backlog of Aston Villa programs, dating back to when he started going in the late sixties. Um, and obviously, being somebody who's into design and you know, kind of that sort of culture, I looked through a lot of them about five or six years ago, and I was like, "Wow, this stuff is this is this is what football programs should look like." You know, today we get these massive corporate report style things that are glossy covered and weigh a stone and they cost a tenner and they're covered in Heineken adverts. And it's, yeah. it's kind of sad, but you look back to this era and there's some, there's a lot of magic in what you see and you can smell the bovril in the pages and you can hear the yeah. fans and they just capture an era really well. So for me as a, as a football fan born in the nineties who, you know, I'm, I'm collecting programs 10 years before I was born because that's the era that, you know, I really love and really care about. So that's mm -hmm. how I got into it. And as Alan said, we met online and fell in love with the same thing, but it was programs, not each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really interesting too. And where, where are you based, Matt? I'm based over in Bath now. Yeah, I'm originally Bath. from the Midlands, but um, yeah, Bath. in Bath now. Okay. And where are you based, Mark? Uh, Peckham, South East London. Peckham, right. Yes. Delboy Territory. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an up and coming yuppie area, then. Oh, though, isn't yes, it? yeah. yeah. No, that's nothing to do with me, but so, <laughs> yes, it definitely, it definitely is. Absolutely. <laughs> we, uh, uh, Mark and I used to, um, I used to live in um, South London as well, talking to yuppies. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and we used to go down and watch Peckham Town play because I used to design the football program for them. So okay. Mark would come down with me. And at half time, they'd play the only fours and horses track. Um, <laughs> oh, for, for a Fantastic. while, I was trying to convince them to get an old Reliant Robin um, with a little indent so you could put a football and drive it to the middle of the pitch like they did in the Champions League, but never happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, just a bit of background to Coventry City's programs. You know, I've, I've got a, a massive collection going right back to 1900. 
07. Um, but I've got most, uh, I think all but five since the war. Um, wow. The interesting thing, the interesting thing about Coventry City programmes, I, uh, they only produced a full programme for Saturday games. They only produced a single sheet for any evening games. <laughs> Um, and they, in 1936, they played Luton Town at Highfield Road. This was our promotion season from Division Three South. And Luton and Coventry were vying for the one promotion place. And this was a massive game. And we played, we played at Luton on the Saturday and got a nil-nil draw. And this return game at Highfield Road attracted a record crowd of 42,000. And it was only a single sheet programme because it was a midweek game. Staggering, isn't it? That's incredible. But, but um, Com you, you all know that Commerce City were real trailblazers in many things in the 1960s with Jimmy Hill, um, you know, the, the, the Sky Blue Express, the, um, the engagement with the fans, the pop, and, the pop and crisps for the young fans at Christmas. Um, the one thing that Jimmy didn't really grasp was the programme. <laughs> if you look at the programme from 1961, before he came, through till 66, really, it didn't change very much. The cover changed, but inside it was pretty much the same. And it wasn't until we won promotion to the first division for the first time in 67 that the, the, they decided to have a, a massive a redesign. And it went from being a very, very average program to being this state-of-the-art super program, which won the Program of the Year award for that, mm -hmm. that season. Um, and it, it was really interesting. If you look at the, those, that program for that year, it was staggering. They had lots of pictures. Previously, they only had they'd only have a picture of the opposing team in the program. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, they had pictures of, of, of away games, pictures of um, the, the uh, players training, for instance. Um, they also had a, a page for the wives. The players' <laughs> wives had a two-page spread where they, they had their favourite recipe in. <laughs> tips. Cleaning tips as well. Uh. Yes. It's staggering. Um, well, Jim, we won't we won't talk about the program that followed the John Elvin season. Yeah. Where they decided they went a bit <laughs> step further with the girl of the match. Yeah, that's um, right. It's it's my favorite. Like the Sun, page three. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. yeah, that that was that was another step. But I know what you, you mean. Actually, I have. I, obviously, we're, we're predominantly audio as a podcast. But I had for anyone with a, a visuals. I, I have the game against um, Arsenal when when Coventry were promoted in that season. You were talking about yes. Jim, and as you say, it, the, the, it, you know, it's it, it's 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 a it, it's a magazine format. It actually has become an official match day magazine. As yeah. opposed to a program, and it prided itself on having, as you know, the, the photographs and you know, uh, you know, great spreads as well. Um, yes. Um, and, and 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 it's the beginning, and and, and as you say, Coventry were really were um, sort of sort of trailblazers in that sense of uh, you know, and a lot of clubs the following season copied to Coventry City. Yes. Um, and yes, tried to did. sort of have a similar version of this kind of magazine. Um, yes. And I think it also coincided, of course, with with when photography starts becoming more and more um, a part of the football program, as you say, yes. and printing and and the kind of there's a big j jump. Um, the the previous programs they could have really been, at, they were almost out of the pre-war period. Yes, nothing really had changed into the sixties, um, and it was a big difference. And I think that the one difference I'm sure Matt and and, and Mark will 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 echo, um, obviously, is is that um, <clears throat> is that it's a lovely program. It's a great, you know, but of course, when John Elvin comes in, things change at another level because it's the magazine, but also it's the layout. It's it yeah. becomes an art form, and I think yeah. that is, I suppose, what we're trying to get at today is what John Elvin brought to Coventry City. Yeah. How did how did he come to Coventry? Because he was at the Albion, wasn't he? Mark. Uh, yeah, he was at the Albion for a year, um, but as 
was his way. He sort of fell out with the, the powers that be because he was so in, driven in what he was trying to do. Um, and then I think there was possibly a bit of poaching from Coventry City who saw the, saw the potential in what he was doing. Um, and, yeah, moved from one to the other. Just, just to, not, not very far, obviously. But the, yes. the, way, the way he got his job at West Brom, even before that, though, wasn't, didn't he make illustrative sort of posters with, like, facts about... Yeah, so they were called soccer prints. So they were single, they were poster-sized prints of um, individual players drawn by um, Ron Greenwood. So Jeff Astle, Peter Manetti, you know, the bigger players of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd always remember our front room being full of cardboard <laughs> tubes and my mum rolling these posters up and sending them to all parts of the country. So Lovely. his interest in football was just, you know, it was off the scale. And then obviously yeah. with West Brom and then Coventry, it just took, you know, there was a focus there, more of a focus. Right. And had he ever had any uh, dealings with football clubs with their programmes before the Albion? No, nothing at all. No, no. no but he, no. wasn't he a Chelsea fan? He was a Chelsea fan um, and lived in Putney, just across the river from Fulham. But he was a Chelsea fan. But as in the days, they used to, go to Chelsea and Fulham because they play on uh, different weekends. Yeah. But yeah, main, mainly a Chelsea fan. Right. Yeah. Our, our only difference. <laughs> yeah, the, the story is is that um, the soccer prints that Mark's talking about were spotted by West Brom. Um, mm-hmm. At the time, West Brom most probably had one of the worst programmes of them all. I think, you know, it, it, if, if there was a wooden spoon for football programmes, it would have been the Albion News back mm-hmm. in the 60s. They were really slim line affairs with mm-hmm. nothing much going for them. And he and, and John Elvin came in and transformed them. I have a, I have a copy here of Albion yeah. News, which you can see. Mm-hmm. And immediately, and I, I'm sure Matt will take me up on this, is, is, is that the, the layout is something else. Just looking at the cover, obviously, as Mark said, there's the Jeff Astle, the star of, 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 of Albion on the cover. Yeah. But really, um, the typeface, the use of this, uh, of, of the lettering, you know, just to sort of take over virtually two, over two thirds of the programme is a very big dramatic step. Um, mm. and, and his time at Albion, um, was was very interesting because obviously not only did he create you know he created a, a horizontal program which was the mm. first a large format it was a very different format and it, it, it um it also had these wonderful um spreads um where you know where, where, where of, of the opposing team which were really really exciting you know for for, for, for for visually they really did they were beginning to to really sort of Zing! There, there mm-hmm. was something really wonderful about about this program, and really, it, it was the sort of it, it, it was it was the moment when I think you know, in a way, it's the year zero for this new era of football program, mm-hmm. and really, I think that's why. And as you were saying, Jim, about Coventry being really ahead of the game, you know, they had got into the first division. They they you know they got this new match day magazine. They were looking for new things all the time, and I think mm-hmm. they saw in John Elvin a very very talented designer. Mm-hmm. Someone who could really step up the program for, for, yeah. for the Sky Blue, make it even more attractive, exciting, different. Yes. Um, and like the city, you know, 60s, new built, new city, modern city, yes. um, you know, exciting place, Coventry in the 60s. And I think it wanted to sort of echo that as well. Um, so I yes. think it really chimed with with the club. Um, and um, and. So I, I don't know what what the kind of tr- the transfer fee was, but certainly, uh, <laughs> um, um, you know, uh, uh, and what's so interesting is is that is that um, is it is that John Elvin was still producing the early programs for West Brom in that seventy seventy one season, right? While beginning his new career at Coventry, beginning. Oh, okay, so, so there was a bit of a crossover, which is very yeah. interesting. And and the following season, you know, the game, um, that was another wonderful season visually. Uh, he produced some gorgeous programs in that 70, 70 71 season for, for West Brom. But um, I, I suppose, you know, obviously, I'm just going to put this cover in front of us and then, I, I, I you know, the graphic designer, Matt, just take over. This is what... <laughs> John Elvin came up with for the first match, Coventry City's first home match of the season versus Southampton on the 22nd of August, 1970. Yeah. Matt, take it away. There Look. it is. No, it is. It's, it's it's actually, there it is. <laughs> and Claudio as well. Fantastic. <laughs> hey, Mark as well. Yay! <laughs> I, I haven't got a programme in me because I, I keep them stored safely in a box, but I do have this, which um, 
Mark Mark gave me, Ooh. which is oh, wow. um, this is and you can't really see, but it's an original print that John would have got produced to sell his programs. Um, and the cool thing about this is again, you can see the same typography with that sort of tri-line design, which is very sort of of that era. In fact, if you look at any of the sort of um the Olympics sort of branding from that era by a guy called Lance Wyman. You know, this sort of aesthetic was the thing. Like, that was the look. Ah. Anyway, this was an original uh, post that was used on the match days. And you can see match day magazine on sale here, two shillings. And because of the because of the nature of the design and what he was trying to do with the with the with the match day magazine and the style of it and the the amount of time and the photography and everything like that, they had to raise the price. So they they you know it kind of rubbed people up the wrong way, didn't it? Um, it yes. Originally, one shilling, hence the name of uh, the book that we've been working on. Um, but then they put up to two shillings, so doubled in price. But he said that that's the that's the price you pay for good design, yes. uh, which <laughs> what would that be probably, the, yeah. the equivalent now. Then I mean, that's ten p two shillings. Well, yeah. it's, it's well, mad as well because in my dad always tells me about how when he used to go to watch Villa play it'd be a shilling for entry and it'd be a shilling for the program. So it, yeah. it's, it's like, it's the same thing. It's just, it's, it just highlights how mad football has gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it would be equivalent. I think most clubs, I think Coventry City's program must be about three fifty. Uh, the Arsenal, it's four pounds. So it would be double. So it'd be eight quid for a um, yeah. equivalent for, a, for, yeah. for a, a, a match day, not, not even a special, yeah. not even a cup final or anything. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. it was a big step, but, um, but significantly, what was so important <laughs> about this program is not only the cover, but the interior. You know, even the the playfulness of of, of here, where where you know the price you pay, and, and there's, a, there's a big image of a, of a, of, a, of um a, you know a, a two shilling, you know, to two bob, um, <laughs> and and this and this page to let for the advertisers. But it was yeah. it was it was you know incredible like spread with Willie Carr, you know, close ups, um, yes. really, really you know like pop stars. It was it was it was as Matt says, it really chimed with what was happening mm. visually around the world in the advertising yeah. world in the pop music world totally it was right. really it, it, it was it, it was it was really something else it was it was it was, it was but, trying to put football really on the map as a, as a yeah. modern a modern but, thing those yeah. graphics yeah. the lettering is exactly the same as i remember top of the pops with yeah. the count with the totally. lines in the numbers yeah. that's totally, right. Right. totally. Okay. no indeed yeah. There's yeah. a lot of uh, there's a real symmetry with the sort of the music scene at the time and, and programs. They were just sort of echoing one another, sport mm. and football and music and culture. It was all just intertwined yeah. in the era. And I think that's why it's so exciting. And you know, it, people were sharing each other's you know the blocks of type that they'd used to print. They were sharing it round, and people were starting to yeah. use the same thing. It became kind of trendy. But John Elvin really set the precedent for this sort of new era of design and. He was sort of the person that started this revolution, as we call it, mm. um, in the late 60s and early 70s. And that's that's the sort of majority of the collection that I tend to focus on because mm. it, it starts to introduce really bright colours. Like Alan said, the photography, he'd, he'd scare the absolute crap out of photographers because they'd come in with their, their, their pictures and he'd be like, <clears> great, <throat> cut them up, stick them, get some effects <laughs> around them so you can't see the edging. The, right. the players in the background, you can see jumping behind you, Jim, you know, those would have been originally a photo that yes. people have manipulated. And these photographers, it hadn't happened before. You know, now we're used to it with AI and all these crazy things going on right now. But back then yeah. it was revolutionary and he was the guy doing it. Um, and it was really cool, actually. We've got some original photos, again, in the book um, of John working. And he actually worked in a terraced house opposite the old Highfield Road Stadium, um, which is really, really cool. Um, I think That's got, uh, 89 King Richard Street. That's it. <laughs> yes. So I used to walk past that house into the main stand then. Basically. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Straight past it. I <laughs> didn't realise. <laughs> there's a there's an image here, which you might recognise from some of the old programmes, where it's Inside Sports Graphic, and that was the name yeah. of his, that was the name of his sort of design studio. And that, that photo there is at Highfield Road. And I believe one of those children in the background might be Mark. Yeah, that is me in the background of that photo. Ah, yeah, wearing yeah. a West Brom shirt. Yes, right. And three of us. Yeah, Absolutely. get him out. Uh. 
<laughs> so yeah. I knew mean, this was going to be a tough night. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's really cool about this, though, is, you know, um, for me, looking at design history, you get, you think about sort of design history and you go to, you know, places that are quite, you know, fashionable and stylish. You go to the Milans and you go to, um, you, you think about like the Bauhaus over in Germany and the, the sort mm. of era, or things going on in London or things going on in Paris. But, you know, this is going on in Coventry in a, in a terrace house. Mm. And it's great graphic design. Yeah, and yeah. It, it just goes to show that these people were, th these designers at the time, particularly John Elvin, were just creating with that, you know, completely from the heart about something they care about. You know, John would go to the game, um, he'd go to all the games, go and watch, he'd take it in, he'd breathe it, live and breathe the atmosphere. And he'd he'd create design based on how he felt about the club and the feeling going around it. And he'd see yeah. the reaction on fans' faces when yeah. it's a nighttime kickoff and he's got white type on a black spread and no one can see what's going on, but it looks good. Um. Oh, I was going to say that because when I was, I was talking to him about the, what we're going to discuss tonight, and I said, the only thing with the programme is I can't read some of it now. <laughs> My eyes are failing. Mm. <laughs> when I was younger, it was crystal clear. Now I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, like playing the trombone, trying to read them. <laughs> yeah. But it does look great. It does look great, though. It does look cool. Um, I think that I was. Think... I think that was potentially all he was worried about. That it looked good. Yeah, whether you could read it or not, he wasn't really worried. <laughs> unless and it was Mark, written. You... Unless it was written by him, obviously. <laughs> and Mark, you were saying that obviously that I remember when we were chatting about uh, about J J John's time at, at Coventry. Of course, he would go to the to, to the training ground to meet the players. Um, did you go with? I think you went with yeah. him. No, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, what was I? Sort of 10, 9, 10, 11. So at that time, it was yeah, un unbelievable to. And there's pictures of me at the training ground with the players, and you know, and you can imagine it's like another planet. You know. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that to have that access at, at that age was, mm. um, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And you were living yeah. in Kenilworth at the time. Yeah, we were living in Kenilworth. So we were living in Kenilworth when he was at um, uh, West Brom, and then obviously we stayed there while he, yeah, um, when he moved to Coventry. But so, right. yeah. The, yeah, the the timing the timing of the new program is is quite interesting in the club's history, because the club had qualified for Europe by finishing sixth in the old first division, a remark a remarkable achievement, considering they'd avoided relegation by a single point the previous two seasons. Um, and so, so it, it, it was almost the zenith of the club's history, you mm. know, sixth in the first division, playing in Europe. You know, yeah. Something that people had laughed at Derek Robbins, the chairman, three or four years earlier when he said, you know, uh, rocket the sky blues to Europe. That was his, um, that was his little catchphrase for selling... Sky Blue Pools, uh, a very, very lucrative um, pools scheme they, they set up. Um, so, but then, you know, the 70-71 season was a real, a little bit of a letdown because although we finished 10th, we, 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 we really struggled. Um, we lost to Rochdale in the FA Cup. Um, we couldn't, I think it's our lowest ever goals for season i think we only scored 37 goals but but um, jim you did score a goal that was yes. going to be seen again mm. and again and mm -hmm. again and obviously yes. for people of my generation mark's generation i'm sure obviously matt has seen the goal on youtube but the yes. the, the the willie car ernie hunt's goal um became something you know the playgrounds across the nation the next day every <laughs> yeah. kid was trying to score the early hunt goal yeah. you know it was it, it became a symbol didn't it of, 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 yes. of football in a sense yeah. it was an incredible goal and it's never going to be happen again because it no. was because it, it was scored outlawed. and then it was outlawed yeah yeah and did they it did do it again you know really they did yes against oh. Tottenham fantastic um, I hope, they, I hope it's all about three. Later <laughs> in the season, they did it against Tottenham, but it but Ernie Hunt hit the bar. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Did it win goal of the season, Jim? Pardon? Did it win goal of the season? It did, yes. Did, didn't it? it? Goal of the month, goal of the season, goal of the century, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you, I, you're I, was, I was there that day as well. Really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I was behind the goal. 
It was my first season. I was only five or six then. That's my first season. So um, it's it's a shame. I was just too young to remember that. I mean, I, I even went to the European games, but I don't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, talking about Europe, Jim, oh, uh, and you know, um, there was two programs, two home programs, um, that yeah. season that uh, John Elpin designed, and obviously. The, the second one, because it was against Bayern Munich, it, it, it is is something of an absolute masterpiece. Yes. Um, everything about it, um, just just the, the layout, the words European sky blue, and of course having the the legendary striker Gerd Müller on, on the cover as mm. well. Yes. Um, it just sets you up for not only a, an incredible <laughs> night at Highfield Road, which obviously you won. Well, um, and obviously, we won't talk about the defeat in Munich <laughs> the, uh, the week or so earlier. But um, nevertheless, um, it's an incredible program, isn't it, Matt? It's just it's, yeah, it's it's absolutely stunning. That's the the typeface is used there is called Neil Bold, and it was something that he used across a lot of his programs in that in that season. He mixed it up a little bit, but um, yeah, you can see that he changed it. He changed the name from Sky Blue to European Sky Blue, yeah. um, and added Gerd. And I think. There's something kind of beautiful and eerie about the way the image has been treated. You, you know, sort of how high contrast it is, and how you know he, he's mid sort of turn and to to champion the other team's player on the cover. It just goes to show how much Gerd Müller was respected. And um, yeah. I, I actually, I, I, I'm obsessed with this pro. I think it's my, one of my favorite things I own. You know, if I have a house fire, grab the program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever else. Um, it's got, it's got but, a continental feel about it, hasn't it? It totally it, has. I mean, you know... It doesn't feel own, British, does it? It feels foreign in some ways. Exactly. You know, he's doing things that people weren't doing in Britain at the time and just the amount of dare, the daring nature of it. And um, there's a spread a bit further on from that one, Alan, where he uses German black letter to say, uh, I think it says Wilkerman by Munich mm -hmm. um, in, in the sort of inside spreads here. And he's used the sort of German yeah. black letter style. Oh, yes. It's just so cool. It's just so Isn't cool. I, I, yeah. I, had a, I had a call with my dad just before, um, just before I jumped on this. And um, I said, oh, you know, like, because he actually has this program. And, I, and he had it in his program collection. It was one of the reasons I started, you know, getting really into it. I, I said to him, did, were you at that game? I didn't actually know. He was at the game. And I said, wow. well, tell, tell me everything. What, what, what do you remember? <laughs> and he's like, I don't remember much. But all he remembers is Soupy Sam um, distributing soup. <laughs> it was, it, was it a character, an elephant or something? He'd, he'd serve soup to fans on a cold night. <laughs> he had him, um, yeah, Soupy Sam. Walk <laughs> around, he walked around the, um, the touchline, the, um, yeah. <laughs> With it, with it, with this thing on his back, it was like a, a heated um, <laughs> container that could <laughs> distribute soup to people. <laughs> but if you weren't at the front of the of the terrace, you wouldn't, you couldn't get it. Yeah, <laughs> we should start a campaign, Jim, at the CBS. <laughs> Bring that soupy <laughs> sap. Yeah, yeah. If we get a sky blue, um, a sky <laughs> blue coat as well. Um, Fantastic. Brilliant. Would well, you know? Do you know that when the draw was made for the Fairs Cup second round, and we were drawn with Bayern Munich, the club immediately made it a fifty thousand all ticket crowd. Um, it was there was so much interest, but sadly, with the result in Munich, mm. um, the actual attendance they only sold twenty six thousand tickets. Mm. Mm -hmm. Which is really sad, you know. That wow. we were we were we were looking forward to seeing a you know a rammed Highfield Road. Yeah, that's um, that's so strange, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. I I think you know even even more so now with Villa playing by Munich in in a couple of weeks' time. You <laughs> yes. know, Munich coming back to the Midlands. You know, it's it it blows my mind that that wouldn't be a completely sold out stadium with queues and queues and queues of people down Highfield Road. Yeah, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, was, I, w I went to Munich mm -hmm. oh, wow. the first leg um, I think it was a it was an overnight stay so we flew out from Luton Airport um, <laughs> got transfers to the to the ground we had a hotel for the night um, we had a banquet after the game in a beer <laughs> keller and um, 
then then flight back from Luton the following afternoon. And the whole thing was a 30 pounds. Oh, wow. 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 <laughs> Which is a lot of money in those days. Yeah, yeah. It was probably about six weeks wages for me. <laughs> 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 but, but it was a fantastic experience. Um, and we didn't play. That was just before the Olympic Stadium was home. So we played in their old stadium, um, which still stands apparently uh, in the sort of back streets of Munich. It, it was wow. on a level with a Division Three ground, hmm. which had one one seated stand, which was probably no better than Rochdale's. <laughs> um, and the, the rain, the rain just. Poured and poured, similar to similar to yesterday. It poured and poured and poured, and the, there were puddles on the pitch. And I don't know if you know the story, but Coventry's regular goalkeeper Bill Glazier had got a knock on the previous Saturday and was ruled out. And they brought in the reserve goalkeeper called Eric McManus um, for only his, I think it was maybe his second or third appearance in the first team and you know they were Bayern obviously knew he was a rookie goalkeeper and they just and the and the pitch was like a paddy field and they just were hitting the ball in from 25 yards the ball was skidding past mm. McManus with ease um, <laughs> it was 4-1 after 20 minutes <laughs> we thought god it's going to be 10 <laughs> um, it was uh, really, really embarrassing. Yeah. But you it, won the home leg anyway. We did, so yeah, we it's did. Kind of a draw. We, we, yeah, we re <laughs> we recovered our um, yeah pride a bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, not, obviously the program, as 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 Mark and Matt, um, you know, would, would echo, is 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 a master, a marvel piece of work. But what's so interesting about John Elvin at this time is that he was doing so much also behind the scenes because. Mm. He was cl when you're close up, when you're working so close to the ground, to the, the you know, you're, you're, you're seeing the players, you're getting a real feel as uh, you know of, of the atmosphere and the, of what it's mm. like to attend a football match and be part of a club. Um, you know, he was bringing in lots of ideas. You know, he he started the Sky Blue Striker Club. Um, there's a, um, I think you you gave me a copy of this, uh, Mark, the mm. the actual membership card for the. Yeah. Uh, for this, you know, which which he produced, um, right. he produced right. badges for for the youngsters. So really, very much getting involved with youngsters. And you had the same at West Brom, weren't you? Sort of throstle number one or something. I was throstle number one, and I was um, I was number one at uh, Coventry as well. Yeah. Really, was, right. yeah, it's, it's, it's not what you know; it's who you know. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Jim are thinking we could do with this for the museum. <laughs> well, yes, we yeah. If, if you can arrange a copy for for us, well, that would be yeah, absolutely, fantastic. I've, I've got I've got lots and lots of stuff. So um, yeah. yeah, if we can, uh, yeah, absolutely, be more than happy to do that. Well, uh, the way. the other thing. So when I, I think when we started writing about the football program, so I started the blog and it's. Uh, um, initially on Instagram called One Shilling and Mark, I think you uh, you either saw us on Instagram or you've. I think we had a, a, a sort of feature with the Guardian or someone, and you saw I, it there. I, th um, I think I saw you on Instagram. I was flicking through yeah. Instagram and the George Best cover popped up. That was it, which obviously Another... piqued my interest. And then there was the little bit you'd written about him, and I was looking for him, and I can't find him. And then yeah. obviously. How we got together and yeah here we are today and another great cover as well that one but yeah, the absolutely. um i thought what was really brilliant what the, when it kind of made us realize that we could you know tell a real story about john elvin in, in our book one shilling was when we met up um at the pub didn't we mark what was it called the what's the pub uh, it? half half moon was it uh it's hern hill isn't it I can't remember it was somewhere it. in hern hill yeah um, yeah can't remember where it was, but we we met up and you brought with you you brought with you basically <laughs> Too much stuff. Basically John's back but his portfolio <laughs> of all his original work, you know, literally cut strips of like the word Albion and, and yes. you know, when he did the program with um Derby County and he had the big sort of Rams written uh, right in the middle and you had the original sort of the different sizing for mm. that they used mm. across yeah. there. All of the, like I said, the tip X around the players and yes. how we cut out and edited it. So Mark has all that collection still, to, and it's it's beautiful. It's immaculate. It's got John's original 
handwriting on it. It's it's really beautiful. And in yeah. fact, the um, uh, Mark, Mark selection and, and John Elvin was was showcased in a in a lovely exhibition last year at the Design mm. Museum. Um, mm. um, they, they they did an exhibition looking at the sort of art of design and football, and just yeah. looking at the sort of the history of the way f- the, the culture of football has been designed, whether it's yeah. from 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 um, uh, the, the design of football boots, the foot the football itself, the shirts, stadiums, everything it's to do with yeah. football. And there, there was one wall which had John Elvin's work, you know, run wow. of the Coventry City programs. Wow! So it, it, it's it's wonderful that he's now been recognised. Mm. Uh, as someone who is who, who 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 played his part, and obviously we'll talk a bit later about you know it was sadly quite short lived, but mm. certainly played his part in really igniting an idea of what you can do, and particularly with the humble football program, this mm. sort of pocket money price thing. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, talking about pocket money price, and you know, obviously, Jim, you must be aware in the archives that you know it was a big thing to double the price of the program. Mm. You know, not a lot of fans wanted to pay that extra shilling or 5p mm. uh, because it crossed over decimalization that season. So it started yes. off as a shilling, uh, but two shillings ends up as, t- as 10p. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was a big move. Um, but, of course, John Elvin was saying, and uh, you know, that, that what you, it's worth it. What you're going to get yeah. is something special. Um, but obviously it's not easy, you know, when you're making those kind of decisions uh, for fans who are, on the whole, they like things as they are. Yes. Mark, Mark, do you know who, who your father reported to at Coventry City? Um, <laughs> no, nobody, most probably. <laughs> uh, no, I, I have no recollection of who he would have reported to, but I, I get a feeling that he was, it was what he wanted to do and that was it. I don't, yes. think, I don't think there was any, any chance of anybody coming in and saying, well, I don't think you should do that. I don't think you no. should do this. It was literally his vision. And, and do we have any any idea if the price increase how the program sales went did, did you know i wonder if you know the the increase the doubling of the price meant there was a, a big reduction in the number of programs sold yeah uh, i'm people... not i'm not sure but i've got a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> well, if that the says anything about home. sales the West Ham at home League Cup is a, a good one to hold on to for some reason. I, I, my dad was in hospital and he, absolutely mad Coventry City fan, and he discharged himself from hospital, uh, went to the game. Uh, my mum went to see, went to visit him in hospital. He, they said, oh, he's, he's gone. And they realised <laughs> he Coventry to watch the League Cup match against West Ham. <laughs> that was the only program I had missing because midway through the game, he split his stitches and had to go back to us. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me ages it took me ages to find that program but I think it's purely because it's West Ham United I know there's yeah. huge collectors in the West Ham fraternity yeah. right, right. And the, yeah. the other question um, is what, what what actually happened with, with the falling out that, that sort of made him leave do we, do we know much information? Yeah, the, I think one of the biggest clues is the last programme he ever designed for Coventry City, where mm-hmm. I say there's a bit of a giveaway. There's essentially <laughs> a, <laughs> there's a whole page de- devoted to what John really thought about Jimmy Hill and the, the, you know, <laughs> the owners at Coventry at the time yes. um, and how they weren't really forthcoming with understanding that good design took time and what people really wanted wasn't just the run of the mill, same stuff. And he wanted to innovate. And I think in there, he does say record sale, even with record sales and winning awards, it didn't matter. They, they wanted it their way or, or no way. Right. Right. Because yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Hall left in 67 as manager. Ah, so, so, so it so would have been at the time. Yeah. Ooh, well, that um, way. I suspect it would the the board direct the board of directors would have a big say in that, and that would mm. still be Derek Robbins and right. John Campkin. Mead, um, pardon? Mead was he one of them? Phil Mead, yeah, yeah. But aren't they? But they would have been old school though, Jim, wouldn't they as well? In their well, Derek, Derek wasn't. Derek was, you know, he 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 was the one that pushed Jimmy to to have all the in, in, innovative ideas. Mm. Um, I, I think. There was a couple of factors, actually. You know, the fact that the, the, the 
the zenith had been we're off we we're off the top you know we'd fallen from sixth to tenth and and gates had fallen that season um so um there was also plans to build more stands they'd already built three new stands in mm -hmm. five years but uh, Derek Robbins had a vision of building a stand at the cop end of the ground, a double decker stand there. Um, and there were, there, were, there were a lot of discussions between um, the directors about where the money should be spent. Should it be spent on the pitch or on the ground and the facilities? Mm -hmm. um, and John Campkin, who had been there from, uh, with Jimmy Hill from, from day one with Jimmy, he actually resigned over that issue. Um, so, yeah, th th there were tensions, I think, in the club. Maybe yeah. they were just looking for cost-cutting, you know. Maybe. And I, I think, as Mark says, that, you know, and, and, and you know, as we've learned about uh, about John, you know, he, he really had a, a singular vision and mm. he wanted to do it his way. And it's quite difficult sometimes when you're in a club where it, it, it there is compromise and there you you meet as a as a group and there you, yeah. you discuss things as a committee, and and John wanted his own way and he was quite he he, he was he would always be very open about how he felt about what was going on in the game. He had a column in the programme called Say So, which was quite direct. It was, it mm. was, you know, a lot of football programmes, a lot of the culture of football, it was, it was very conservative. You just didn't really push push the the boundaries. You know, you really kind of stayed within yourself. And I don't think John was that kind of person. He also that was pretty wild. You know, let's face it. You know, he's the, he's the person who produced... The Coventry City at Christmas, mm -hmm. just red program. Head You've got that as well, yeah. you? you know, with with, with Santa scoring. You know, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, you know, um, you know it, it was it was his second wacky Christmas cover. He done he did he did one for West Bromwich Albion the previous season, and ironically, this one was also against West. This one was against West Brom, so it was Coventry beat West Brom yes. over the Christmas period, and and here we have um, you know Santa. Um, you know, kind of, uh, kind of striking a good volley there, um, yeah. and, and the multiple <laughs> images of Santa. Um, yeah. it, 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 it's a complete, completely wonderful program. Um, well, and, and most most clubs for their Christmas program would have a little sprig of holly on the front. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and this one goes all the way. This is definitely yeah. you know, this, this. This is where you know that. You did swallow that psychedelic sixpence in your Christmas pudding. <laughs> you know? um, it, it goes all the way, um, and, um, and, and you know it's a terrific masterclass. It's, of, it's of, the of, confidence, of, isn't it? And it's yes, the exactly. freedom. It's the freedom to create what he wanted. It's it, as we yeah. said, it's the singular vision of one guy yes. who was able to get this stuff through. Whereas today, you know, there's so many different you know people we've got to go through before something, especially at a football club. You know, their businesses and the, the, to yeah. get something signed off now, it has to go through everyone, from you know the manager to the to the owner, and yes. uh, you know making decisions that appease massive sponsors who really bankroll the clubs now. Um, yeah. so if, I was, if I was John, I'd, I'd feel underappreciated here because they've got a list of the, on the front of the president in order, the chairman. It goes through <laughs> the general manager, secretary, chief chef, and catering manager. <laughs> then the main the hotel, then the advertising consultant, and then last but not least, magazine editor. Designer. Which, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised he didn't change that round, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's almost like they're saying you, you've got to know your place, isn't it? It's, you know, you, you yeah. don't. You dare not, dare not go in front of the chef and the catering manager. <laughs> totally. I, I think that's the thing as well. And this is why. This is why programs are kind of being cut now and why it's not an obligation for English football league teams to have a program anymore. Like it used to be, you know, I think the value of design is overlooked and, um, you know, money and, you know, being able to keep things delivering and be able to um, every single pound you're spending, be able to account for it and show that it's got a reason. But, you know, design's not about that. You know, um, football culture is very different to other things, to other businesses. I mean, during COVID, for example, um, when fans weren't allowed to come into the stadium, everyone still watched football, but it wasn't the same, was it? Like, yeah, we still had interest in it, but mm -hmm. it was like, oh, okay, I'll watch it. But, you know, it's it's just not the same without fans. 
and it's it's the kind of the same for programs really in my opinion like football doesn't need a football program in order to you know open the turnstiles people go and watch a game it doesn't need it but it makes it better mm. and it's part of the culture it's the visual stimuli that locks you into those sort of um, mm. into the sort of walls of the stadium and focus your attention i feel like now more than ever with people you know checking every single app to get the same score and get different updates you know in every mm. moment I feel like there's still a place for taking your time, taking the game and appreciating the football programme still in, in its own way. My, oh, uh, my nephew for three seasons was part of the graphics team at Coventry City did for the programme. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I'd get a call saying, we'll be playing Bristol City. And the one I can remember is obviously the 77th season. And he'd ring me and say, we've got Bristol City. This is obviously League One or the Championship. He'd say... He couldn't dig out that program because I, I fancy doing like a mock up of some <laughs> of the old program in the new program. And I'll be in yeah. the galleries looking for it and <laughs> that several times. And on Legends Day, I think a couple of times, he, he that's what he used to come up yeah. with the idea of what to put on the cover. This so I thought, it. this is a new guy in his early 20s doing graphic design, mm -hmm. wanting to look at the mm -hmm. old stuff and try mm -hmm. and produce it with a a modern twist kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. I mean, it's, yeah. if you if you walk down if you walk down Brick Lane now in in London, everyone's wearing retro football shirts. You know, it's what people love. Those things behind you, Claudio, are like people yeah. absolutely love yeah. them. You know, yeah. and you can be Cara yeah. Delevingne, or you can be you know yourself <laughs> going down going down to uh, the football, and you still you know you love retro shirts because they're beautiful pieces of design. And I well, think this is Legend Day from last season, and they've used a program from about the mid. Eights is, I think, Jim, about 83, four season. Yeah. Yes. You yes. know, and it's so they, in some ways, and I, I love that cover. It was much better than the one they were using during the season, to be honest. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, Claudio, uh, we, we've been doing Legends Days for uh, 16 years, 17 years now. Mm. And it was my suggestion that they use was a retro cover. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Well, that's they why I used to great. get them. Yeah. It right. go, Uncle Cloud. How, you haven't got the yeah you know, the program a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, it was annoying because it was a reproduced program, and I went, "Oh, hold on a minute!" It was, it was uh, called off, wasn't it? <laughs> and the Bristol <laughs> City seventy seven was the little pamphlet, wasn't it? As well that's as the right, yeah, that's as well as right. The right. I think it, it just yeah. goes to show, though, doesn't it, that there was clearly there was an era in football that people still appreciate and and want to get back to. And you know, yeah. be able to really rep and yeah. you know see through all the betting adverts and and see the club for what it is and the fans who are creating these programs or shirts or whatever it may be. You know, but don't don't you think the modern day programs are all pretty much the same? <laughs> I think there's definitely it's some exceptions. Generic. They're across the board. Yeah, uh, there's. Yeah. Some, I, uh, I, I think I there are. Like there most probably has to be exceptions, but on the whole, they are pretty similar. Because I, I think the thing is, is that, yeah, yeah, I stopped collecting away programs about ten years ago because they, they were they're all exactly the same. Um, but then somebody gave me this season, no, it was last season, the Millwall program, but it's not an official club program. It's produced by the fans, so there are no adverts in it, and it's got, uh, you know really good match reports, none of this sort of, um, uh, what's the word, establishment type um, <laughs> yeah. match reports. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no criticism yeah, yeah, yeah. of the team. This is, this yeah. is the fans' yeah. view. It's, if you get hold of yeah. one, uh, they're very, very interesting. There's like a step yeah. up from well, the you know, Obviously, there was a period when, when, when the, the fanzine, you know, particularly with the arrival of the fanzine, where every every team you know, would have a fanzine, and fanzines were the sort of scissors and seller tape, and they were very much closer to the roots and the grassroots of the mm. game because obviously mm. they broke away, and they had a, it's another view of football as seen by the fan as opposed by the board yeah. and, and 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 the and and the you know and the marketing companies, but nevertheless, I think that you know I think that. The difficulty is is that football programs today are, are are very similar because really they do the same thing. 
color photographs of players, color photographs of uh, um, throughout, and mag you know, it, they become they, they, there is something incredibly generic about it because they don't need to. It's a sort of laziness, it's a sloppiness. But also, mm -hmm. I think as just Matt was saying, it's it's not essential anymore. It's not seen as the key ingredient to the match day experience. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think back to seventy seventy one, um, this the competition program was recognised significantly not within the game itself but also um, it won an award didn't it Matt it won one of the big design awards um, which yes. was a very significant for a program that's made on the you know produced on the corner of a of a terrace <laughs> by a football ground in the Midlands to win one of the most prestigious advertising and design awards yeah it shows what level Elvin had reached mm. totally I think it was even for just one or two of the spreads that he designed that's what mm -hmm. actually won it. It was sort of they presented it on a board and back back then, and that's how you did it. It wasn't even, I don't even think it was for the full program. I think it was just for right. some spreads, which were almost seen as like art in their own right. But yeah. you know, this is an award scheme that it's called DNAD. It's still running now. And the people who win those awards, you know, it's, it's companies like Adidas and Nike winning it all the time. But you know, right. once upon a time it was it was Coventry City and it was West <laughs> Brom with Sky Blue. So um, yeah, it's it's really cool. So, so John knew um, at that last home game of the season, um, he knew that the time was up. Yeah. They? So, like I said, there was there was a page. I don't know if you've got it handy, Mark. I've got it. Uh, it, oh, it, oh, it in the programme, the, the Sky Blue number one. So he actually says on, on the cover, Sky Blue number one, in the sense yes. that it is number one. It's, it's, it's the number one programme in Britain because again it won the award yes. for the for the best program of the year. But uh -huh. he had already lost his job. And right. in the program it is RIP. RIP Sky Blue Mark II. And his, yeah. that was his nickname for this this project, Sky Blue yeah. Mark II. But talking um, of RIP Alan. Uh, when RIP. All the pages ripped out. <laughs> well, they were ripped out by the I think before I, the I'd game. heard that. I, I I'd heard that there was a rumor that someone behind the scenes at Coventry City before this programme was sold, and the last game of the season was against Newcastle United, yes. that someone was trying to rip out this page, wow. which, yeah. where Elvin says to his the next person, okay. saying, good luck, mate, you'll need it. And, no. uh, in a sense that, you know, this is what I'm up against. Yeah. You know, sort of people who don't realise the sort of, the, the, the genius... <laughs> Yes, <laughs> what I've been doing. Um, it, 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 you know, it's a sad. You know, so in the end, there was there were twenty seven of these, twenty seven Sky Blue, um, mm. on, on, you know, which included all the league games, cup games, um, and I think of the friendly against Aberdeen. Uh, mm -hmm. throw yes, in, um, yep. which I think is the hardest one to find. Actually, I think that one most probably, along with the always Ham, Claudia. I think oh, that, that, that Aberdeen program is because yes, I, I wonder how many people turned up for that match, Jim. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yes. And it's yeah. the, the, the Aberdeen one, I think it's got the, the Aberdeen team coach. They'd won some cup yeah. or something in Scotland. Yeah. Which what why why would you put a opposing team coach on the cup? <laughs> <laughs> I, love I, it. I, I think that was another thing about the programmes is that he actually put the opposing team on the front cover, which I don't think was a thing. It, right. I I'm not sure, but no, you know, George, no, George Best on the front, you know, like yeah. the Aberdeen yeah. team coach. Yeah. So have you got a signed one of that, Mark? Mark, haven't you got a signed one? Of I've the George got a Best? signed George Best one, yeah. Oh, blimey. Yes. Oh. Yeah, the museum would love that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well then, let's talk. So, what happened next then? <laughs> what happened to John next? Um, he went to Chelsea, right? Yeah, it, it, six. There was a bit of a gap. There was um, a gap. He 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 um he didn't have a football club. So basically, he he there was no team came in for him. And now whether whether that was due to the way he left or whether he was frustrated about what happened at Coventry, he he gets signed up by um um Clive Everton in the Midlands, who was doing the snooker scene. Mm -hmm. And the hockey scene programs. He was a, uh, a Midlands-based journalist who um, who had quite a lot of publishing kind of clout and put out these publishing <laughs> magazines. So, so he he carried on creating visually um, interesting magazines, but outside football for for, for oh, snooker yeah. and hockey. 
Um, and then I understand, Mark, that he did return to London, didn't he, within a few yeah, years? Yeah, came back to London and, yeah, um, got a job with Chelsea. I think it was 76. Yeah. Um, but again, just didn't have the freedom to do what he wanted to do, mm. like he had at Coventry. Um, yeah, mm. so it didn't last particularly long. But um, uh, he returned to his roots. They, they, when he when he returned to, to Chelsea, of course, they were a second division club. I, 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 as, uh, you know, as a North Londoner, I've got a big smile on my face. Um, but um, yeah, they were in the second division. Just to just to remind everyone that Chelsea were in the second division. Um, they, they won promotion that season. They did. They did. Yeah. Uh, and they, actually, the Chelsea programs were were tastefully designed. They were nice programs, and you could see something of John in them. But you could see there was something holding him back as well. So whether he was being the reins were being pulled back, you know, that he was just told to get on and do a job. Yeah. Um, he'd obviously worked for the BBC, hadn't he, for the Radio Times for a yeah, while as well. Yeah. So he 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 he'd been working as a sort of designer in house, and um, and obviously the, his team, the team that he supported as a youngster, took him on, which was great. Um, but of course. There was something else happening, and um, uh, maybe you know, obviously I'll, I'll if, if I may I'll pass it over to Mark because you know J J John um, throughout in his second season at Chelsea, right? Um, he, he was diagnosed with 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 a, a, a very terrible illness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Huntington. So yeah, I think I was seventeen, eighteen when he was diagnosed. Um, mm -hmm. So seventy-seven, seventy-eight. But I think you know potentially. Year or two years before that, we'd seen changes, um, but it took him a while to diagnose him. And uh, yeah, um, from there, sort of lived with that for fifteen years. And um, did it did it bring an end to his um, design work? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, I mean it was sh so short lived, right? I mean, what yeah. two seasons at West Brom, two at Coventry. Yeah. Well, one, one at Coventry, one at Coventry, Coventry yeah. Yeah. two at Chelsea, yeah, um, yeah. and that that was it. Um, yeah. But I, I guess I guess the the amazing thing though was how his work and what he did influenced other people. So one of the other people that we've interviewed along the journey is a guy called um, Bernard Gallagher, mm -hmm. um, who also worked with I believe worked with Clive Everton in sort of the Midlands sport sort of um, mm -hmm. magazine sort of world. And um, he worked under John initially, and he was set with the task when he was very early on in his career working at a printer's called Peerless Press. He was given the job of typesetting um, a page, a big sort of double page spread with, um, I think it was West Ham, wasn't it, Alan? Um, and it had lots of different sort of players on it. And um, he was given that task, and John thought he did brilliant. So Bernard at that point was sort of, you know, he was given he was given John's seal of approval and was then sort of went and had his own career in sort of designing programs. And he, in his own right, was a brilliant designer and did mm -hmm. work for Miller, did work for um for for Luton, um, for Oxford, for Newcastle, you know, all sorts of clubs. And again, this was up even to the nineties. He had um programs even up to that era were still very it wasn't all sort of corporate, it was still very casual. He mm -hmm. Bernard Gallagher had this story about I think was it Ron Atkinson or Ron Saunders, Alan? Um, it was Ron Atkinson. Ron Atkinson, Ron Atkinson yes. Yeah. Um he was he, he needed to write the managers forward and he, he couldn't be bothered. So he called up Bernard and said, Bernard, you write it. And he said, I can't, <laughs> you know, you're the manager. <laughs> and he's like, No, you can do it. I know you can do it. And he ended up writing the managers forward. So, you know. <laughs> All these things happen behind the scenes. Things are so <laughs> casually done, but you know, even since the nineties. Well, that's yeah, that's a per perfect timing because um, I've got the book. Uh, yes. You can't see it properly, actually, can there you? There it is. No, I got one here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. it's and, the same um, colours as the oh, John oh, Elvin oh. work. So you... <laughs> the, the, the book. Yeah, the, the, the book is absolutely oh, excellent. Oh, but now, um, but it does have a really good. Um, section on the the people he influ that John influenced like Bernard you mentioned Bernard Gallagher and others mm -hmm. and their story and how they took on you know, a lot of John's principles and That's style mm -hmm. um, to, to make a name for themselves in in the program world mm -hmm. um, absolutely yeah he, he touched a lot of hearts and a lot of, sort of design I career. think you know reading reading the book and listening to you guys 
to my mind, John was like a shooting star. Yeah, mm. it was short lived. Yeah, very but much. He, so. he, he, you know, he had so much influence on on the program world. Mm. I really yeah, do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a yeah. good expression, Jim, shooting star, yeah. you know, um, because, you know, in a way, as we know, shooting stars, you, you, you get this incredible display and then they just disappear. And yeah, like, uh, to a certain extent, that is the case of, of, of John Elvin, because that work, and particularly for Coventry, you know, the West Brom program is lovely, but he really honed his craft down for that, for that, for that yeah. one year, 70-71 at Coventry City. Yeah. And it's a beautiful set of programmes. And also, I think, you know, to share with Coventry fans today, if they're interested in buying them, you know, like a lot of this period, the programmes are not expensive to buy, you know, unlike mm. the sort of pre-war era programmes, mm. which are highly desirable and, and, you know, collected and very expensive to find. Um, the, you know, these programmes you can still find at Pocket Money prices and i'd really recommend you know for people listening to this to to go out and you know whether it's online or or, or finding different ways go to program fairs and pick these yes. programs up because they really are worth looking yes. looking at for everything we've been talking about they're, they're beautiful yeah. artifacts time and capsules, they, time yeah. capsules and stood yeah. the test of time they feel yeah. fresh mm -hmm. um, and that's the important thing some things feel dated now i know that the pit the, the the visuals of of the time but still there's something about that vintage quality mm -hmm. that yeah. makes it so refreshing and, and exciting to a new generation and that was obviously it was great to do the book with matt because obviously matt and i are different generations but yeah. we kind of can you know that connection over something that is really so so special well, any, anybody who's um, ever bought a football programme should buy this book because it's, yeah, it's, it's wonderful, absolutely it's amazing, wonderful. An amazing book. Yeah. yeah. It no, was a lot of fun to make. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it took a long time. <laughs> but um, it was just, yeah, good fun. So, yeah, yeah you, it's still available. Um, we actually had, we had it republished by Pitch Publishing. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I know the Pitch level. people, yeah. Waterstones and WH Smith and all those sort of places. Yeah. Amazon, even if you want to go there. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the first, um, the, the 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 first run was put out. Um, so we we kickstarted it, but also yeah. we we worked with the Huntington's charity. Um, yeah. so Wonderful. The, the mm. Proceeds would go yeah. to them because obviously that you know that we felt that that was really important. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. That that that, that we could recognise that um, yeah. and. You know, I, I think as well, what was so important about doing it is 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 that is that yes, John was recognized, but not like the designers of record sleeves or big advertising mm. kind of campaigns and fashion oh. things. It's not in that level, but it should be. And I think we wanted to really say that this stuff is is up there with the best of design yeah. um of, of that era. And yeah, and yeah. like John Elvin should be should be seen alongside those those totally. greats. Totally. Yeah, yeah when I think of record design covers, I think of is it hypnosis? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stone yeah. Dogs, yeah, and Roger Dean, absolutely. Yes, yes. yes. You can yeah, albums. You can yeah. tell the prog rockers, can't you? <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got my Genesis <laughs> on again. Oh, very good. <laughs> I think we'll call it a day now, but really, a really fantastic. Um, hour we spend and thank you so much mark and alan and matt absolute it's, pleasure thank you so much thank you thanks jim thanks yeah, thank you i really much. appreciate it yeah. thank I'm you, glad you came on. It's, it's, it's totally different to what we've done before so it's it's fantastic absolutely fantastic yeah. and i know people watching uh and watching this and listening to it because obviously you put out on youtube as well will will love it the one thing i didn't do is put our banner across the bottom so jim do you oh. want to tell people where to contact you if they want to come up with a suggestion yes. Anybody who's got any suggestions for our podcast, it's send me an email, clarryborton at gmail.com. And no, no self-respecting Coventry City fan doesn't know who Clary Borton is. <laughs> <laughs> you know Alan, don't you? I do, but I don't remember seeing him play. It was a few years oh. before my time. And yours, <laughs> Jim, and yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you again. And what, what, um, what, year, what era did he play, Jim? What what years? Uh, 1931 to 1937. And well, we need him now. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. He uh, he got 49 goals in the season 31 32. 49 league goals and one FA Cup. 50 wow. goals. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. He was a legend. Um, That's a good way okay, to end. Well, thank you very much.
Thank Pleasure. you. Do you want to wind up anything else, Claudia? No, I was. Oh no, I think we've run out of time. I was going to say you know, the best games against Coventry City, but they failed miserably against us every time this lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Alan, that interesting that pick that program you had of Arsenal playing at Highfield Road in sixty-seven eight. Yes, that was the game that Bobby Gould sold himself to Bertie May. Ah, he so scored cool. a goal that day, ah. and uh, two weeks later he signed for Arsenal. Is that the that's, that's not the double headed program, is it? That one, is no. that the yeah, there is another, another one that season that is when I think, yeah, we that's played the league, cup, the league game. cup, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 and it was a double header with City, but yeah, that's an interesting one. And 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 actually, you know, I know we, you know, we, we I don't want to be the say be the long goodbye and keep this going. But we could, <laughs> I'm I starving, say, Alan. <laughs> I, I want to say that not long after, and I, I, I'm not sure, Claudio, if you could even reproduce this or be allowed to, but of course, the sky blue changed direction slightly. Yeah. Um, yes. with, into the big format, lovely. This is my copy. It's actually got Frank McClintock on it, signed. You can't really see that, but it's signed by Frank. Yeah. Um, but I didn't get the signature of the uh, the person on the back of the cover. <laughs> the back. Yes. Of. Um, and obviously, I'm not sure what John would have thought of that, Mark. You know. Oh, <laughs> can't say if he. Very what? happy with that match, probably. No, <laughs> no. On the back different of, times. One of the women on the back of the programs was Olivia Newton John. They were actually models. Oh. They weren't actually fans. That's a, the big con, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I've never seen women like that at Coventry City. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, you do now. You do now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's somebody's yeah. grandma. Huh? Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Thanks again. Thanks nice again. Thank yeah, you so really much. Thank yeah. you. Cheers. Thank you. Take nice. care. Nice to see you all. <laughs>